What is up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Breathe and Air podcast, where everyday action meets extraordinary. Mindset. Today we have chiropractor, co-founder of Therabody, chief wellness officer, and the creator of what you all may know as the Theragun, Dr. Jason Wurzland. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Can't wait to talk. My pleasure. I love the topic. So I want to start with you know you waking up at 5 a.m. for your first job as a local farmer. And what did that really teach you at an early age? Well, it was actually, I wish it was five o'clock. A lot of times it's earlier than that. Um, growing up, you know, spending summers and spring in out of our farm, you'd have to milk the cows, you know, you'd get up in the morning and it was old school. Like you literally had the, the pumps, the stick them on the udders and, you know, you'd wait for them to finish and the cows would kick. And you just, I started realizing like it's it, this routine that people are in is really where a lot of the success comes from. It doesn't come from you know, having a good week. It comes from having a good year and watching that on the farm, whether it's the weather or the crops for that particular year, or the amount of hard work that went into the little things, you know, building a fence. You wouldn't think that's that's such a big deal, but you know, the the tools you need and the resourcefulness watching that happen from a young age was just became part of me. So I'm grateful for it. You know, it's one of those things at the time where I'm like, man, this sucks. But it was, it was, I look back on it now and it was, it really made me part of who I am, you know? Yeah. It, re- it reminds me of when I was younger also. And I think it was one of my first jobs, actually, a guy across the street from me was, um, you know, a VP of sales for a big tire company that was based in St. Louis. And so I, you know, I'd asked him if I could get a, a summer job at he put me in the warehouse and I was working in the warehouse, no AC, super hot, you know, sweating my ass off every day, you know, around grown men too, they're paying child support and I'm seeing all this and I'm just working in this environment and I get done with the summer and I remember going back to my dad and going back to him, thanking him for the job. And he was like, yeah, you know, I wanted to put you in the front office to do sales, but your dad told me to put you in the warehouse. <laughs> went back to my dad. I was like, what's going on? He's like, that's why you use this and not this. And I was like, all right. It's a good lesson. It is. Uh, you're quoted saying that pain is a great motivator and it's a necessity in the mother of all invention at the end of the day. And I think that was definitely the case for you in the genesis of Theragun. Take us through that moment and what that was like and kind of how you got to the early stages of Theragun. Well, there's varying degrees of pain and, and we all experience that. What was happening for me at the time was it was so serious to my nervous system that it's all I could think about. And as a chiropractor, I knew what I needed. I needed pain relief and I knew one or two ways to get that. And it just didn't make sense to me that that's all you had. You know, I'd have to go see my one of my closest friends at the time who was in my same clinic, work together. He'd treat me, but he can't treat me for 24 hours. You know, he treats me for 30 minutes, maybe an hour, depending on what modalities he's using. And I would think to myself, this can't be it. This can't be the only way to deal with this. Like there's a lot of people out there in pain. And so I'm in Los Angeles. I'm figuring that if there's anywhere on the world that I can have access to anything, it would be Los Angeles. And I get the same answers that I would have if I was any other city at any other time, pain medications and surgery. And I was like, I'm in my 30s. I don't need any of either one of those. I had an experience with someone really close to me who'd got hooked on drugs after a a procedure and I saw the decline of his life and I'm like, I don't even want to touch any of that stuff. So the pain is a motivator. And like you said, it is the mother of necessity. At least it was for me because I was like in this space of pain and I was looking for something to get to take it out. And because my pain was so intense, the smallest little things made a big difference. And so I, I started recognizing how quickly something would make my pain tolerable, at least tolerable. And I was, so I started learning about vibration and then I you know, started kind of understanding that vibration never really leaves the body. So our body can accommodate to that, which is like a watch or, or shoes or a shirt, anything I say, you're not thinking about those things because your nervous system is focusing on something more important. So I was like, well, what if I had something that, that hit my body? I felt like there's certain areas underneath my armpit and on my shoulder where I just needed some good impact and I couldn't get enough leverage in my own grip to get to those areas. So I made the first Theragun in, two, in early 2008. It was a jigsaw that I just took from my garage and talking back to the farm days, I just being resourceful. You know, I didn't care. This is one of the things I talked about in the early days is 
I didn't care what it sounded like. I didn't care what it looked like. I didn't care what you called it. If it could be, it was something that could help take the pain away, I'm in. And so I start, made the first one within the first five minutes of using it. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Someone's had to have thought of this before. That's, that's not a jigsaw. So I just figured, well, for now I'll use this. I'll just keep monkeying with it and changing it and fixing things. And I would just, I just did a bunch of things. And it was really the first three months, the only reason I used it was for pain relief. And I used it on a daily basis, hours a day, just to keep me out of pain so I could kind of move through and my movements and like working on the laptop. I couldn't see patients at the time. I was in my clinic hours of school. So I had a lot of clinic documents and stuff I had to do. You can't focus on that stuff when you're in pain. Pain's a motivator. I think anyone that's been in pain understands that. It's like the guy who has everything but can't get out of bed. And, you know, then you realize that health is wealth at that point. And, you know, for you going through that crash and and really being in tune to your body and your mind and the correlation between your body and your mind, I think for me too, it was, I had multiple surgeries. I was on that table uh, multiple times through athletics and all of that good stuff. When you go through some traumatic, you really do realize, you know, the connection between the body and the mind. Till that injury for it to be like that for you to start realizing that? Or was that something that you really realized early on when you were pursuing, uh, you know, becoming a doctor in chiropractic? It was a belief that I had. I believed that that would work. I believed there was a connection. To be honest with you, I didn't know the path. They say you've got to get out of your head and into your heart. And I would try that. And then I'd start to understand what that meant that I'm getting out of your head into your heart. And then when you get back in your head, it's through a heart led it's through a heart led uh, intention and so when i started as i started learning that i started recognizing these states of being that i would be in that was like so far away from pain and recognizing that that came from within that came from creating a space for me to feel a certain way and you know i started learning in my early like in 2009 10 11 12 i started just kind of understanding what quantum i call quantum breathing just being able to breathe these things into your life and use your nervous system to navigate that so it was wasn't that obvious to me to begin with i believed in it i had a mantra that i would say you know i started when i was driving to school in 2004 2003 maybe and I would tell myself, today's a good day. Today, something good is going to happen to me, for me, or around me. Today, I'll make someone smile and someone will make me smile. And then I went through these other positive inputs and I would feel really good. At the end of that, I remember just feeling like for a few minutes sometimes, maybe shorter, I felt just this cool frequency. Something ha was happening to me that I was like, okay, there's something there. And Theragun started me on this quest to understand the things that you and I are talking about now. And one of the most profound things, and I'm not just saying this because I'm on your podcast, is breath work. What the states that we can put our bodies in through breath work is, I think it's one of our biggest secrets. It's the holy grail. You think about oxygen, carbon dioxide, like the exchange of those things. It's the same things that the universe is made out of. It just, it, it really started opening my mind to a lot of things. And I'll tell you, dude, I would not have had that experience had I not had, had the accident. I would have been to the grindstone, just trying to work the hours and see as many patients as I could and try and heal the world through that sort of avenue instead of going through what I went through. And one of the things I think about a lot now, especially because people say, oh my God, it's so crazy to see how good your company is doing. Man, there was 10 years it wasn't doing that. There was 10 years where I really had to dig deep every day and wake up and convince myself to go out and believe in something. And it wasn't from, you know, it didn't come from family. In fact, they were most critical sometimes. And I tell people that, be ready for your family to be the most critical about what you're doing in life. And I just, you know, there was, it was a lot of mindfulness. And at the time, I don't know that I would call it meditation, but I had these times where I would look forward to uh, right after I would work out and I'd go through a breathing exercise. And for some reason, my body was ready for that at the time. But you know, that the mind body connection is what we're creating. We have TheraBody. And I know, I don't know if you're getting into this, but it's a little sidetrack, but the TheraBody, we created these amazing products for your body. And I started seeing that, you know, working on some of the best athletes in the world, I would see that we're providing the most state-of-the-art, awesome products for their body, but they would get up and perform and they just wouldn't perform at their best. And I'd realize that a lot of that's in their head and a lot of that's them not being, having a coherent sort of system inside their body. And they're stressed out about money or a contract or their family or personal things. And it took them away from something that we were trying to do that was like bringing them to the present. Suddenly they were living in somewhere else that wasn't near where they are. 
So I started thinking, well, we have, I can't ignore that. If I have Cristiano Ronaldo laying on a table and he's in his head about other things, I need to be able to connect with that and have him connect that with his body. And then he can go out and be in the present. It's a loaded question you asked me because that's literally the process that I've been on. I'm still in that hunt. I'm still looking for those things that create stronger connections. I think the heart is such a very big, important part of what we're doing. And as a doctor, you think about you walk in to see a doctor and they've got a stethoscope around their neck. It's the first thing they do is check your heart. You know, hey, how you feeling? I'm feeling great. They check your heart. It's pounding out of your chest, 80 beats a minute. They're like, what is going on? You're not right. Okay. The heart is doesn't lie. And I think products we're creating, our go smart goggles have a PPG reader that reads back your heart rate, your pulse. It's really important that we start getting in touch with that. You know, I, I think there's still some really amazing things that we can validate the frequencies that we're experiencing at certain times. Uh, and I really think breathwork has a, is a big step, big key to that. It's that biology, you know, being able to use our biology for our advantage as opposed to it using us. And, you know, our mind isn't always going to lead us down the right path. I think we know that from the psychology of sales and marketing and dopamine and, the, you know, everything that's being tossed at us these days, you know, it can be something that's used to our detriment. But at the same time, we have the power to use all of these tools in our biology, in our mindset, like you said, in our heart to be able to be our biggest advantage and to win in life. And that's really what this podcast is all about, right? Is unveiling that so that people can realize that it's at our fingertips. And breathwork is definitely a big part of that. I want to talk a little bit about between 2008, 2011, when you had these multiple different iterations of, a, of this process and this project that you believed in, you know, how important was, you know, having that mindfulness routine or, you know, having those affirmations to hold on to when maybe everybody else doubted you at that time? What did that do for you? And what was that time in your life like? In 2011, I had an experience where I felt like I connected with something and I recognized that it was bigger, way bigger than me. And I recognized that whatever that was, was going to be my light. And whenever I had a negative experience or negative input from somebody, I would reference that in my mind. I literally would go to that space and ask that, this thing, like, should is this right? Is this not right? And somehow I would find these in the forks in the road, I'd, it would lead me down the right way and I would suddenly find my way into a place that was much more important than where I was. And so for me, you know, understanding that I was on a journey and that I, it was gonna, it wasn't gonna end. It's not like I felt, I honestly felt like I was not going to get somewhere, that I was on this path and I was heading somewhere. And I don't know that I'll ever get to that place. But along the way, as technology advanced, we got we had lighter products, we had easier um, materials. I remember in 2016, a friend of mine from Silicon Valley introduced me to another guy and the guy said, Hey, did you ever think about putting a chip in your Theragun? <laughs> I just laughed at him. I'm like, why would I have a chip in my Theragun? And now we do. And it collects so much data. It helps us personalize that. So in just a short period of time, I still learned these lessons that, oh my God, that's actually a great idea. And so, you know, back to your question along the path I had, and I think if you talk to anyone that's had these experiences and you probably have as well, there's just something inside of me that knew what I was, where I was heading was right. I knew I would mess up. I knew it wouldn't be right. I made, like to your point, I made five different versions of a Theragun. And obviously they weren't good enough to be able to take to the market. And as much time and money as I spent in those. And I also had, I don't talk about this a ton, but I had three different business partners through those five years. I mean, from one of my closest friends to a brother, another lady who was friends with my dad. And I ended up getting it horrible partner stories. They were not doing what they said they were going to do. Those were times where I really had to gut check. Like, wait a minute, am I really doing? Because you're having people that are close to you. Like, this isn't going to work. You're never going to get there. What are you trying to do? You're a chiropractor. Why aren't you in a practice instead of out here working power tools? This, I don't know what you can call it. I mean, without sounding too frou-frou, but it was like this light that I felt I connected with from my inside and it guided me. And all I can remember is telling me is what you're doing is big and big has slowly taken on different meanings over the years. And so for me, when people say, did you know it was going to be like this? No, I did not. But I knew it was going to be big, but I didn't know what that meant. And I think the when COVID hit, you know, there was there was this moment where suddenly 
everyone was paying attention to their health in a different way. And that we, our message just seemed to resonate and we didn't change our message. We didn't change what we were doing. We we're just doing the same thing. Just happened to resonate with more people. That was a huge one for me. I remember just thinking, oh my God, this is going to be it. This is when people really start to understand what self-care is. So it's a, you touched on a really deep subject for me because it's where I connect when I'm breathing. It's where I go to. It's like I'm, I see in my brain what I'm showing up to something and I'm having a conversation with that thing. And I don't know that I call it God. I just, it's like this power. Yeah. Anyway, you're going to get me off of this little frou-frou tangent. I've used the product, you know, way before I really learned about the origin and, and, you know, read into your story, but even just watching you talk about the journey that you've been to now on your website and stuff, it's like, you can see you getting emotional and that you're a heart led person. And I feel like oftentimes that's hidden from society in a lot of ways, especially as men. And so I thought it was amazing. I'm like, well, I love this even more, you know, that I can connect with someone who is really passionate about what he's creating and really believes in that. It's less about the customer believing in what you're doing versus them believing in you and your belief and seeing your belief in in that product. I think that is even more important. You definitely evoke that. And um, I just wanted to point that out because it was definitely something that I noticed. But, you know, you talked a little bit about the different iterations and five of them and you know, all the failure, the business partners, those kind of things. What is your relationship like and how do you look at failure after going through that? I don't believe in failure. I think failure is giving up. That's what I believe. So if I give up, then I've failed. And so for me, it's like, if I can walk towards the resistance and we all feel resistance in our life. And if you think about the things you might be afraid of. You know, I do these meditations at our company. And one of the meditations I talk about is think of the thing you're most afraid of. Think of one of the worst experiences you've had in your life. Let's go there for a minute and let's flip the switch. Like, let's get you into a better state. I learn more by walking towards resistance. And what I get out of that is strength, just like working out. You know, like if you're not lifting the right amount of weights, you're really not going to do anything. I honestly wish I would have learned this when I was younger, that there's really no failure. Because what ends up happening is you have this yucky feeling that comes from failure. Like you feel like a piece of crap. You just don't. And that isn't, that doesn't serve us well. I remember, I'll give you an example. I had this, I was trying to make attachments. This was in like 2010, 11, 12, 13. And I had designed the cone and I had designed the wedge and I had found a guy that was going to make these for me. And the process of doing that was so painful. And there was something that told me this isn't going to mean anything anyway, but I have to go through this process to learn something on the other side of that. And that I know that if I had the mindset that I did when I was younger, I probably would have just walked away from it. But I had to see it through because there was still resistance. There was still something there. I still felt me hitting a wall. And I wanted to get through that. So I tell people in life, walk towards the resistance. If you're having a tough time in your relationship, don't avoid that. Go towards it, directly at it. It's probably going to hurt. It's probably going to feel gross. It might be super overwhelming, but when you get on the other side of it, the self-confidence that you gain from that is something that no one can give you. So I think people should be eyes wide open when it comes to failure. Like walk right into that and recognize what it is. You look at anyone in this world that succeeded, they've failed. I mean, I've had a lot of failures in my life. I actually have a little TED talk I wrote about failures because it's what led me to where I am today. You know, like going through all of those iterations, those people would technically call those failures. But what I learned from every one of those is what you see in our Gen 5 Theragun. It's this iteration of all these different experiences where I know what it has to look like. I know what it has to feel like because I've been there and I did the wrong ones. You know, I think there was someone that said there's a thousand ways to do something wrong. And there's one way to do it right. Well, I think I figured out all the thousand ways before I found the one that was right. So I, it's a, it, for me, it's a really powerful topic and subject with failure. You know, I, I think it has a lot to do with what's happening in the world today with younger kids and Instagram and them feeling like they're worthless. They're not as good as this other person, but not stepping back and recognizing their own journey. Had I not done that, had I not recognized that, I would have, I remember my brother has a, a, a thriving pra chiropractic practice in Utah. And I would fly home to see my family and be with my kids every other weekend, go to his practice. And I just feel like such a dirtbag. I'm like, this guy has people rolling in out of here. It's busy as ever. He's treating people. And I'm back in California trying to make these power tools with these plastic attachments. Like, what is my deal? 
But I had to get on the plane and be like, nope, this is my journey. That's his journey. This is my journey. And I don't like the word failure because it just means that you gave up. No, whatever, whatever it is, you just don't want to learn how to surf or you want to learn a new language or you want to learn a breathing technique. The breathing is tough. I don't think people understand sometimes your nervous system doesn't want you to do what you're trying to do. And it's it's going towards that resistance and having this sort of calming experience about where you're headed. So I mean, I could tie that into a lot of things, but I can tell you that failure for me is not a word, really. It doesn't, you know, I think there's just so much learning from it. It reminds me of the analogy that I'm probably going to butcher this story, but where there's a bunch of cows in the field and they see a big storm coming in and instead they start from the storm and the storm just from as they're trying to run away from it versus the cows that see the storm coming and they run straight to it and pop out on the other side where it's clear, right? And the storm keeps going the other way. It's that weird thing in our brains that, you know, wants to lean into comfort. And that's that's where our mind is tricky because it's not the thoughts that we have, it's the thoughts that we attach to. And like, there's so much going on up here that oftentimes, you know, our brain and our chemistry is gonna lie to us. And it's going to steer us towards those comfort, those comfort places or those comfort things or those comfort people when they may not be what's best for us to reach our potential. So, I mean, I, you, it's something I, you constantly have to remind yourself that it's easier said than done. Tony Robbins, when I was younger, Tony Robbins, I was listening to his tapes that I think it was a 90 day thing to better success or whatever. And one of the things that he would say, and it really stuck with me, and it's still, you can tell, obviously, it's a big part of me today. Pete, we will do more to avoid pain than we will to gain pleasure. And if you can flip that and use that same energy to find pleasure, that's where I, that's one of the sort of secrets that I used along the way is like getting up early was tough, but guess what, man, it paid off in the long run. And I, I did more to find joy and than I did to avoid pain. You had mentioned meditation a little bit and you had mentioned in previous interviews, you know, that meditation um, has been a practice for you. And, you know, that working under pressure is something that you think you're very good at and that you can thrive in, in those high pressure opportunities and situations. So how, if any, have the two correlated with, you know, your meditation practice and being able to be calm in the chaos? Meditation. So what I, what I thought initially was there was a connection to being, doing something in the moment. So um, say we're in a meeting and it's a heated conversation about a product or maybe there was a delay or something and it was going to cause these issues. And I used to think to myself, what can I do in that moment? Like, what can I do to change my physiology in that moment? And I started learning that it wasn't that. It was the preparation for that. It was the time that I spent outside of those meetings. It was the time that I spent by myself where I could drop in super quick and connect with that. So that when I was in those moments that I, my heart rate wouldn't go up and I would suddenly be in a sympathetic state where I'm fight or flight and I'm just freaking out. So I would have to find ways. And, you know, they, there's a lot of science now that talks about, you know, a meditation practice can help you sleep better. But it's not because you meditate while you're sleeping. You know what I mean? It's that dichotomy, that separation of recognizing you got to put in the work. And when you put in the work, then you're able to get through those pressure times. And listen, like talking to you right now, I sound like I don't have, I can get right through it and it's no problem. And I come out on the other end, no big deal. There's a way the universe has of stepping up the challenge. And I, and that's one of the things I think that's tricky with my brain anyway, is shouldn't be this hard. I'm just using an, an analogy. Like th it shouldn't be this difficult. Like how can it be this hard? This must not be right. This must be the end. When we were building our Gen 2, our G2 Pro, we had worked with our engineers and manufacturers to make the motor quiet. I showed up to the manufacturing plant to approve. I was what they call QAQC. I was quality assurance and quality control. And I was making sure that everything was working the way it should work before we could say thumbs up. Let's start making these mass production. Well, the idea was that the motor was going to be quiet and we were hearing it over Zoom. It was actually Skype at the time. And so they'd turn on Skype and they'd, we'd get on the call and they'd turn the gun on and you could hear it hum. And I was like, oh my God, we did so amazing. We got it. So I show up to the plant. I turn the Theragun on. It hums just like I heard it. And I start using it on my body and I push, I add pressure to my body and it breaks. And I broke eight of these in a row. By the third one, I realized what they had done. 
and they had forgotten one of our key elements, which is torque. We have amplitude, frequency, and torque, and they forgot the power, the torque. So I was just picking them up and pushing them against my hand and breaking them in front of them. And it was, I was like, this is it. I came this far and we're, it's over. My business partner took me out of the building, up on the roof of this 13 story building in Shenzhen, China. And I'm looking out over the green crying because I thought it was it. It's over. We did it. This is as far as we're coming. And he says, we have, we're not done. We can fix this. We have a couple of different ways we can get through that. Again, you go, you go back to failures, like feeling like that was it. I think that's one of the tricks the universe plays on you. Yesterday, you know, 25 pound dumbbell was heavy for you. And now today you got to do a 30 and it's just a little bit more, but that's how you get better. So I think the, for me, the challenge has been to not succumb to the intensity of the experience that's happening at that moment, but stay focused on the outcome on the other side of it. And sometimes that takes an hour and sometimes that takes a week. Sometimes it takes three months, but you have to stick to it. And the meditation mindfulness practice always brings me back to something that I feel really confident in. And when I don't, man, I start feeling like a leaf in the wind. And that's important because it is, <laughs> it's easy to get blown around especially when you're going after something like that and building something from scratch, especially entrepreneurs. Yeah, it's it's important for sure. You had mentioned, you know, your three business partners prior, Ben, and you have this partnership. And, you know, I want to talk a little bit about how important it is to find a good partnership in your business and, you know, what that has done for you and the growth of the company so far. It was part of our rocket fuel. You know, there were, I could only do so much and meeting Ben and realizing that he had as much or more that I had to give to relationships, product development, that he had to give to business. Man, I'm telling you, you know, once we took the training wheels off and we started recognizing what each other's powers were, he stayed in his lane, I stayed in my lane. It was super easy to hand off a conversation to him because that's not what I talk about. And he could talk about that. I have some really good friends of mine that remind me how lucky that is that you, that I met Ben and that we both sort of had the same vision about what it was, what this should look like. You know, it's not easy. I mean, I, I love Ben like a brother. And if you have a brother or siblings, you fight, you know, you get in arguments, but there's always love on the other side of it. There's always like, I didn't mean that, but this is what I was trying to explain. And, you know, we're in it like a marriage, like there's no, not going to end. So I consider meeting Ben one of the most pivotal moments in my journey um, because it took us to a place that where we are today. It seems like there's such a good compliment between you two. And it's definitely amazing to see it, you know, flourish into what it has. I want to talk a little bit about, you know, the creation of a category because it's really what you did and, you know, kind of the keys to anybody that's looking to innovate or build something that doesn't exist. We see a lot of iterations or creations off of current categories, but really, you know, you created a full category itself and innovation is kind of a buzzword these days, but that really is what you did. So tell us a little bit about the keys to that and maybe some of the challenges that you had to overcome when you're creating something that really is brand new to the market. What comes to mind when you ask that is, is I had to learn that there were some principles and Dwayne Johnson talks about this, but there are some principles you have to have. Have. And when you have those things, success is inevitable. And for me, those three things was consistency, persistence, and delusion. I had to have delusion to believe that what I was doing was going to work. You know, when you're standing there in front of physical therapists and you're showing them this thing and they're all looking at you like, what are you talking about? That sense of like, you got to look at yourself and like self doubt settles in the, for me, the secret to what happened was something that we all can practice. It's just varying degrees of that being consistent. And that, and I'm talking about the little things, waking up at the right time in the morning, having water, making sure I'm hydrated, working out and exercising. You talked to, I'm reading this book right now. This guy talks about how important it is to be physically fit, to be able to go out and do what you do in the business world. So for me, it was, it was being able to have those, just dial in on those three things. And dude, when it came back to having a bad day, I would try and get back into my routine. Okay. It's 6 PM. What do I typically do? Go for a walk, breathe, 
figure out what's happened that day. What can I learn and take into the next day? What are my goals for the next day? I would lay down at night and I would read my goals that I wanted, the things that I had that I wanted to focus on. So when I woke up the next morning, that's the first thing that came to my mind. And I'm telling you, it's novel. It's just doing something every day that's going to take you towards your journey. I honestly felt like if I can make a 1% difference every day, that at the end of the year, it's 365%. And I literally, that's what I would focus on. If I can get this into one hand today, that's going to share that with their group. And I luckily in LA, I was worth a lot of celebrities, but they have really close knit groups. They're not taking this on a TV show and talking about it in front of millions of people, but being able to get it out there into those hands, that's what my focus was every day. Consistency, persistence. And that means like picking it up when you drop it and just keep picking it up when you drop it. And then delusion, you know, when you have people looking at you like, you're crazy. That was almost one of the things that kind of guided me. If someone said, you're crazy, that'll never work. I'm like, okay, well, that's what I'm doing. It's usually a sign that you're on the right path when when everybody else is saying, what are you doing? You mentioned, you know, getting the product into people's hands. And I think when I look at, you know, what you've done and what the company has done, you know, partnerships and word of mouth and the people that have been on board with the company, whether it's athletes or your everyday you know, mom that is trying to fix a ailment that she has, you know, an incredible job at that. You mentioned Cristiano Ronaldo. I mean, one of the, if not the biggest athlete in the entire world holding your product. So how, what kind of went into that and, you know, the process of that train that really took off and, you know, now you see a lot of guys and a lot of companies and a lot of organizations utilizing your technology. Like what was, what was the catalyst to that? Or what was maybe that big break that really started getting? You know what? One word, relationships. I, I'll give you an example. One of my very good friends, closest friends is, his name's Nico and he's the medical doctor for Real Madrid. And I met him through another mutual friend and we immediately hit it off. Just the way we think and how we kind of navigate things. And he's sort of a no nonsense guy. Like, you know, if you're not gonna do it, then I'm not gonna do it. Like, that's how he talks to the players. If you're not gonna put in the work, then I'm not gonna put in the work. And we really hit it off. We met in 2014 and never in a million years would I have thought we would have partnered with Real Madrid. Like I never thought about, that wasn't even in my thoughts. But what was in my thoughts is Nico. How can I support you? What does that look like? Anytime I was in Europe, I would make sure I went and saw him because I would learn so much from him. So what you see right now as a company is from relationships. I had a relationship of trust with Nico. And when it came time for us to have a bigger conversation about how we can work together as two companies and make their product better, their players, we were, the trust was so strong. There's, I've kind of navigated these things in my life. I follow a three-step rule. I call it BRT, support, educate. Build a relationship of trust. And I tell people that can take a year or a beer. Next thing is support. How do I support you? How do I support the people around you? And that could be just education. That could just be teaching you about why you would use something at a certain time versus another time. And it could be like, you know, I, I remember there was a skateboarder that I was, we were working with in the early days. And I said, hey, how can I support you? And he's like, man, I don't know. And he's kind of thinking. And I'm like, hey, think outside of yourself. And he's like, dude, my land keep, my groundskeeper, the guy that mows my lawn and stuff, he would, oh my God, let's get him one of those. So we gave him a product to give to that guy. That experience of giving what this skateboarder knew was so powerful to this guy who probably couldn't afford it. Those moments are what built our brand. It's that relationship. It's that connection. It's not the price point. It's not the color. It's not our packaging. All of those things are really important, but that's not what made us who we are today. And, you know, I, I could tell you so many different relationships that I have where I don't ask for anything unless it's we're exchanging information. You know, you look at some of the products we have today. I learned a lot of that. We learned a lot of that. Our engineers are from Spain. So there's a connection there with Real Madrid. And we learned a lot from feedback. And we wouldn't have had the, that honest feedback if we didn't have a relationship. I could answer that question in one word and just say relationships and we'd be done. But I wanted to give some context on that. It's, it's the only thing we can really take when we leave here. So I think that's a really important piece of, of what's made us who we are today. Yeah, you touched on it a little bit, but you were quoted saying, you know, it's more about creating an ethos. You know, it's an ecosystem and not just a product. How does that factor into, you know, the ethos and the values that Therabody stands behind? Well, I think the people that work at Therabody, whatever their job is, whether it's warehouse, marketing, 
engineering, science, you talk to anyone and they'll tell you we're changing lives. One of the first things that happens when I treat somebody that's never experienced it before, the first thing that comes to their mind is someone they love, a parent, a pet, a friend that's going through something and they'll ask, hey, would this work on arthritis? Hey, my dog has hip dysplasia and it's he can't walk. Would this work on my dog? They know what that felt to them. They want to give that feeling to somebody else. And that was a big part of our brand. And so when you look at people that are working in our company and you talk to them, they're here putting in the hours because they believe what we're doing can change someone's life, can make a difference in someone's life. I think I don't think it's ironic that pain was the reason I made the first one and keeping people out of pain still to this day is a big part of who we are and what we're doing. It's the ethos, our ecosystem is really important, but it's why we're doing it. The why is still really a big driver for, for our success. You've also created an ecosystem of products now. And you know, you mentioned some earlier with the smart goggles and a lot of really cool innovative stuff i mean wellness tech like that's that's amazing that gets you excited to hear so tell me about some of that process like when you have an idea or you know someone brings something to the table for a new product like what does that look like to say this is this is a yes or this is a no well it's a process like you're saying and as we built this industry as we built this vertical i guess you'd call it I'll give you an example. I remember I was I was at an event or at a training facility somewhere. This happened a few times. I would take the Theraguns from whoever was doing the treating and I would treat that person. I'll give you an example. So we're, we'd be at a trade show and the a husband, a couple would walk up and I would say, here, let me show you how to do this to your wife. And so I would treat him and then I would hand the guns to him and have him treat his wife. And his wife, she'd like squirm and move around. And I'd take the gun. I'm like, let me show you how to do this. And I would do it. And I realized what was happening is he didn't know how much pressure to apply. So you take these things in your hands. You've never had them in your hands before. And they look like they're going to hurt somebody. So you don't really dare push on it. So you're kind of, you're lightly doing it. And lightly doesn't feel good. You have to add a little bit of pressure. So I started seeing that. And I went to our engineers and I was like, guys, we need a pressure gauge. Like we need to be able to know how much pressure you're applying so that it can scale. Because this tool is only so good if you don't understand how much pressure to apply, whether you're doing it to yourself or someone else. The product would bounce on people. I'd see it just bouncing like crazy instead of just you know being really smooth. And we realized you're pushing too hard. So if you're pushing too hard, the body just can't resist that. So it's it, those experiences are is what led to what you're talking about. It's like, okay, I see a difference. We have to do this. Let's change that. But then when you come to some of the technologies, like you said, wellness tech, you know, it wasn't very long ago that we couldn't measure what your biometrics were on a, whether it's whoop or, or, or a ring or whoever, it wasn't too long ago. So you think about what's happened since we started Theragun and to today, there's a lot of technologies that are available. And back to what I was saying earlier, if we're not thinking about the mind, we're not thinking about the heart, we're only thinking about the physical body. We don't know what the end result is. We're working on some technologies now that that are close to getting ready to, to launch. And one of the things is, is this practical? Could I give this to a top athlete and my mom and they both get it? Would it be effective for them? Would they understand how to use that? Can we make the tech that's easier? It's a button. It's a feel. It's a look. It's all of that stuff. That's part of the fun in the process is really understanding how to have it translate to my mom. And I use that term all the time because she represents a demographic of people that need our products, but they're not on Instagram. So how do we get to them? Uh, and then you go all the way over to the other side with the athletes. And if I, I was with some athletes, some quarterbacks, NFL quarterbacks on Saturday, and I had a new product, our sleeves. I don't know if you've seen the new sleeves we have. So I threw a sleeve on one of them and turned it on. He was like, Oh my God, that's amazing. So go try it out. Tell me what you think. And he comes back. He's like that dude, that's amazing. It's also those times where you get that validation and they recognize you just put three things together. No one has ever done before. And now it's like the product. It's part of the fun in the journey, but I'm telling you, it's also tough. I mean, there's a lot of products that never make it. We vet it out. doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. It just doesn't roll with our brand. We acquired recovery pump and we call it recovery air now, the, the pneumatic compression. That just fit right in. It just made sense. The company that came on, the people that came with the company, those are the kinds of things we look at when we're talking about technology that we can add to the company. Does it fit with our ethos? Does it tell the same story? Does it help people understand that they can do it to themselves? It has to be autonomous. If you have to have someone set you up on things, 
then you're kind of limited. So I, that, those are some of the things, some of the guidelines we use when we're building products and combining wellness and tech together. I personally can't wait to see what it continues to do and, and hopefully we'll be a part of a lot of it, you know, going forward because yeah, it's, it's going to change a lot of lives, like you said, and it gives us just such a deeper look into the intricate, you know, amazing thing that the human body and mind really is. And, you know, I hope it continues to lead people down the more holistic path and, and realizing that a lot of the answers are within us um, already. And so, yeah, it's, it's exciting stuff. But speaking of exciting stuff, you know, the recent news of appointing Mani Sharma as the new CEO. Tell us a little bit about that. You know, what went into, um, you know, him taking over on that front and then the future vision for the company going forward. I think the most exciting thing is now we have a trio, myself, Monty and Ben, that are able to do all of the things that we're really good at. And it's going to benefit each other and the company. Before Monty came on, Ben was trying to, you know, he was trying to keep things going and he was navigating things that weren't, he's not an accountant. It's not what he does to be able to navigate the finances and stuff. What, what's happened now by bringing Monty on is it's now given a CEO, Monty's CEO. It gives Ben the ability to go out and do the things he's good at, which is product development, negotiating on pricing on our products. You know, you think about saving a dollar a product, that's a really big deal at the end of the year. And those are things he's really, really good at. And then me on the innovation side, being able to think of these ideas, work with our engineers and having Ben come in. One of the things that makes he and I strong together is I'll come up with these crazy ideas and he'll look at it and go, that doesn't make sense to me. I need it to make sense to me. And then I go through this process of, okay, how can I explain it? And what do we do? And what's the tech we can have that makes sense to him? And he's like the proverbial customer that's standing there looking at our stuff at Best Buy and like, what is that crap? So it was super helpful. But then you take, bring in Monty, who's had success at EAS back in the day. I don't know if you ever remember EAS. There's a supplement company, Atkins, Naked Juice, Weight Watchers. He's been in this health business and he understands the flows and the ebbs of how businesses have to work, how to scale a business. And I think the three of us together, it got better. And, and I didn't think it could with Ben and I were doing, but when Monty came in, and again, what's really powerful, and I don't think people understand this, is I am a founder. I'm not the founder of the company. So there's things I can do and there's things that I don't do. And the things that I don't do, I have someone that could pick up and do amazing at that. And when you have, it's like an amazing team. You have a good receiver, an amazing quarterback and a really good line. Like there's some, not really much you can't do. So for us, it's just kind of getting into our rhythm. He's been here for like five weeks, I think, but it's getting into our rhythm and being able to work together to build and amplify the things we are each good at, leaning on the other to give us support as we grow. So it's an exciting time for me. I feel like, you know, we had a, we were in a rocket ship 2019, 2021 pandemic. It was just like this hockey stick growth. And now we're sort of leveling off and it's not a bad leveling off. It's actually a good leveling off. You know, you have, think of the nicest, most expensive yacht in the world. But if you peg that all the way to the ground, to the front, and you're just running the motors as high as you can, you're going to burn it out. So it's just finding that really even pace where you can run at a good clip. Everyone's doing what they're supposed to do and it all adds to the, to the greater good. So I'm excited. I mean, what's going to happen for this company in the next five years is going to be, I think even, I don't know that I understand what it's going to be, to be honest. It's going to be big. I don't, five years ago when Ben and I started seven years ago, I don't know that I would have been able to describe this to anyone that Theragun would be like a household name. That seems crazy to me. And what can be bigger than that? I don't know, but I do know that we have a winning formula and bringing Monty in just made it shinier. Can't wait to see what continues to go and you guys have a very solid infrastructure in place so this guy is incredible and it's the limit really really excited to see that there's a question i always love to ask to end it is what is your definition of success feeling like i did everything i could that day it's not a bank account it's not a house it's not a car it's a watch it's honestly for me it's knowing that i did everything i could when i went to bed that night i think everybody knows where to find their body but if they don't 
plug it all. Where, where can everybody find it? It'll be in the show notes as well. But Thera, Therabody.com, at Therabody on Instagram. I think it's the same on Twitter. We're on TikTok now, which is kind of new. I'm not super familiar with that, right? Mine is at Dr. Jason Wersland. Um, on Instagram. We've got one of the things we didn't talk about a lot, but we've got an education. We have Therabody University built in our website for massage therapists, physical therapists, and people, professionals that want to use this. If you're watching and you are one of those, please log in and check that out. Our education program in there is pretty cool. It's got continuing education credits. Therabody.com, at Therabody on Instagram. Uh, I do lives on Thursdays. So if anyone wants to jump in on a, on a live, we do lives on Thursdays for about 10 minutes with some really cool guests. Thanks for having me. This was really cool. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining. Everybody go check out Therabody. Let us know what you thought about the episode today. And as always, share with somebody who you think could benefit from today's conversation, Dr. Jason Worsland. Jason, thank you so much for joining. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me.